Oh, that's a new feature. Okay, so we're, we're being recorded. Welcome. I hope everyone has uh, survived and successfully returned to normal after the uh, latest skirmishes at the border and in the country. Um, as you saw from the announcements, we're giving a homework extension on the deadlines for homeworks five, six, and seven, which were either given on or due during the operation. So if you have not submitted them yet, you still have time, take your time, um, you know, put whatever effort you need into it. You won't be penalized for submitting them late as long as you uh, get the job done and submit it eventually. The point of the course, as you have already noticed, uh, revolves around a lot of, of self work and, and homework, which also determines 50% of the grade. So take your time, do the exercises, uh, and you'll have the extensions you need following the situation. If anyone has more serious impacts from the situation, uh, let me know and we can see what we can do for the duration of the, of the course. You will eventually have time to submit all the homeworks that are given. Uh, you need to submit 80%, which would probably be about a total of 10 or 11 exercises. Uh, the, late, the last one will be due throughout July. The exam is on August 1st, so there's enough time to, to both do the homeworks and prepare for the exam. The exam will be a frontal exam? A... No, no, no. As announced yeah. in, the, in the first uh, week of the semester when we had the, the uncertainty over the COVID-19 situation, it's a 24-hour house exam. Uh, so it will be similar in format to the homeworks, but you'll only have 24 hours to do it. So you should be um, um, pre prepared and on in control of the uh, material covered in the course so you can uh, do it quickly. It will have some multiple choice, uh, some, some uh, selections between different questions, but they will cover all the material from the course and you'll have about 24 hours to, to complete it and submit. Um, okay, also to give you some time to recuperate from the operation and to get back on track with the course, today's lecture is a rather light one. Uh, I don't think we will have more than maybe one or two equations and simple ones at that. Um, the subject is exoplanets. There's a typo in the title here, which I will fix later. Uh, exoplanets and extraterrestrial life, that is planets outside the solar system, and possible life outside the Earth or the solar system. Uh, a rather, it, it's a subject that covers a lot of different aspects, not typically associated with hardcore physics, a lot of biology, uh, even some social issues. Uh, so it will be mathematically light. But next week, we start the heaviest mathematical part of the course, which is general relativity. Uh, so this is kind of the this lesson today is kind of the end of the first part of the course on a light note, and then next week we dig deeper into uh, GR, modern physics, and actual uh, things that you might have even heard about on the news, black holes, gravitational waves, and things like that. Any questions before we begin? Okay, seeing none. Uh, the history of life outside the Earth and the possibility of there being uh, otherworldly worlds outside the Earth and life on them is also a very old subject, as many of the subjects we've seen in this course and will continue to see in astrophysics and, and cosmology. Uh, in ancient Greece, they already uh, had this idea, common between philosophers at the time, uh, that the universe is actually infinite. And if the universe is infinite, there's no reason why the Earth the, on which we live should be special and should be the only place in the world um, that, to actually house life or even intelligent life. So we have here a quote, uh, a quote by Democritus, the laughing philosopher. Uh, he earned the name the laughing philosopher because of this uh, notion of the infinity of the world, of the universe, uh, and the relative insignificance of us and anything that happens on the earth to the entirety of the universe. Uh, he had a, a light note and a, a humoristic note about it. Uh, you know, how, how bad can it be? We are insignificant specks of dust. And here's quote is saying that 
there are infinitely many other worlds. They can all be different from each other, uh, but some of them can actually be be similar to ours. They can be uh, they can house uh, uh, plantation, vegetation, animal life, and even even um, intelligent life, human or otherwise. Uh, Alexander the Great himself is uh, quoted as hearing of this idea, realizing that uh, from his advisors and the philosophers which were surrounding Alexander, uh, that there are other, other worlds, other planets and other civilizations. And he uh, was quoted to regret this idea and to, to feel sad that out of so many worlds, uh, he could not conquer even a single one in its entirety, uh, which in some sense is a, a joke on Alexander the Great and his notion of his position in the universe. Uh, but on the other side is a, a note on how they saw the universe and how philosophers of the time, and Exarchus in this case, and uh, others, Hippalcus, Epicurus, and Democritus, saw and realized that the universe is quite large, infinitely large, and so our own life here cannot uh, reasonably be the only one. This idea kind of uh, died down or dissipated out of consensus through the Middle Ages. Um, in particular in Europe, the Catholic Christian church at the time uh, did not like this idea. Um, Christianity is centered on there being one God, that's the monotheistic God. Uh, we know that from Judaism and other monotheistic religions as well. But unique to Christianity is the idea that God also uh, has a son, Jesus, uh, who is his only son. And since that son lived and died and other things on earth, then earth is in that sense special and God should not have any other children elsewhere, which means that other civilizations on possible other planets uh, would not enjoy the Christian idea of um, grace and the presence of Jesus, and therefore they could not exist or should not reasonably exist. So this was a theological argument uh, throughout the Middle Ages that there should not and could not be other peoples or other civilizations elsewhere because of the centrality of God's only begotten son, Jesus, um, to, to earth and, and human civilization. Uh, Giordano Bruno, whom we discussed earlier in the, in the semester alongside Galileo Galilei, Copernicus, and the people who were part of the, the scientific revolution, uh, moving the earth outside of its central position in the geocentric models of the universe uh, into being just a planet around the sun, that same Giordano Bruno uh, resurfaced the idea that the earth is not only not the center of the solar system, but it, that the solar system itself is only one of many uh, solar systems in the universe, and that there are many other planets and many other civilizations living on them. And it was for this idea that the church burned him at the stake. He was executed for this notion um, that other civilizations exist and therefore Jesus can no longer be the central only son of God. Uh, today, we, we don't remember the, the religious and theological debates so much uh, of the time. We kind of see Giordano Bruno as burning for science or a scientist being burned for, uh, for the heliocentric model. Uh, but it is worth noticing, noting that it's not the, just the earth and sun system or debate that was a problem to the church at the time and to the political authorities at the time. Uh, it was the theological questions that came after following that about the possibility of other worlds and what that means for the tenets of, at that time, Christian faith. Uh, so this here is a picture from, uh, from his trial, which today is engraved on a pillar at the Campo di Fiori uh, Square in Rome, where he was burned. Uh, jumping ahead to modern time, it seems that at least popular notions have kind of switched from the impossibility of extraterrestrial or alien life to people seeing them everywhere and people kind of jumping to the conclusion that if there's anything that you cannot explain or do not understand, um, aliens are always kind of this uh, ace in your sleeve that you can always pull 
and suggest that you know, maybe aliens did it. Uh, this is a long, long-term trend. Uh, here on the right top, we see a depiction from the late 19th century by Percival Lowe, uh, an amateur astronomer, a former diplomat turned at, at amateur astronomer uh, who used a telescope to look at Mars. And he saw these uh, kind of lines which he imagined to see on the surface of Mars. And he described them as canals, canals or channels. Uh, and he supposed that these kind of straight lines could not be created naturally and therefore were an indication of actual Martians. And this was kind of one of the first modern uh, speculations about, about actual aliens that we can detect and notice their activity. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't specific about whether they are still alive or whether this ended a long time ago, but he definitely claimed that he's seeing a feature uh, and that the only explanation he could think of or the best explanation he could think of at the time was that aliens did it. Uh, today we understand this claim as, as false. Uh, we now have much better observations of the Martian surface, both with telescopes and of course with probes sent to Mars, filming and, and uh, imaging Mars from uh, Mars orbit uh, and from landers which have landed on Mars and explored the surface. One as recently um, as a few weeks ago, uh, we actually had two probes landing on Mars in the last couple of months. I think one uh, NASA probe and one Chinese probe. Um, so we know Mars much better now, and we know that there are no such canals on Mars. We understand this today as an actual optical illusion. Uh, so the human eye has a tendency to, to see features uh, even when where there are none. Uh, and we understand Percival Lowell to have kind of basically seen dots or random features in the surface and his mind completed the picture by connecting the dots into these lines, which he imagined as canals. Um, more recently, or of, of a similar type is the, the um, uh, book images here on the left. This was a very famous one uh, about 60, 70 years ago. Uh, my father read it as a child, and he gave it to me to read as a child by Erich von Daniken. Uh, it's called Chariots of the Gods. And the, the notion here is one that still persists in, in popular science or popular pseudoscience, uh, which is saying that here on Earth, a lot of technology that we see uh, in monuments and other artifacts from thousands of years ago um, cannot be explained, or we don't, we, People claim that they could not be explained by the local conditions and technological means available to humans at the time as we think of them. Things like the, the huge pyramids in Egypt, uh, things like um, uh, structures in the region of Sumer and Babylon, uh, pyramids also appearing in, in South and Central America and elsewhere in the world. Uh, Chariot of the God specifically derives its name from uh, the chariot described in the book of Ezekiel, so Yechezkel, Hamer uh, describing allegedly the, the chariot um, of God or of the angels, including descriptions of electricity and lightning and all sorts of things that uh, that, that from Daniken described as being indications of technology, of aliens somehow pretending to be gods, uh, instructing Ezekiel how to build. Uh, a communication radio set uh, and other ideas, basically weaving together uh, things that we don't understand from either archeology span or, or historical religious texts uh, and explaining them as being old depictions or old creations of what we now understand as, as technology or modern technology. Uh, most of these claims are today completely um, um, rebuked we don't believe any of them anymore, uh, both because we understand technologies and, and methods of operation and engineering, which were available a long time ago, and we saw them reproduced in many civilizations across the world, uh, and because we understand our own technology better, and we no longer expect in the 21st century an, an actual advanced civilization, like, like an, one capable of interstellar travel, uh, of using technology which looks like 
uh, radio receiver from the end of the 19th century. So as our own technology advances, we no longer think of, uh, we, we no longer try to enforce our current technology as the standard of international uh, superior, interstellar superiority. And, we, and on the flip side, we no longer expect civilizations which are not our own to be completely uh, impotent technologically. So this is actually a, a development of the last few decades uh, in both technology and understanding of the social um, development of technology. Slightly maybe more, uh, more interesting or more puzzling are claims coming from space about observation of things that we do not understand uh, that could be signs of the alien intelligence or uh, alien activity. A famous one is here in the center. This is uh, the first pulsar detected, PSR uh, B1919 plus 21, uh, detected at Cambridge. So it's also called the Cambridge pulsar 1919. When this pulsar was first detected, uh, it was detected as a series of pulses, uh, one after the other in regular intervals. The pulses are not entirely identical to each other, but they do repeat at a very regular spacing. And when they first saw them, they were uh, proposed to represent uh, communication, basically some society issuing a signal, a radio signal. So they got the nickname LGM for little green men, kind of the, uh, the canonical popular culture description of Martians or aliens. Uh, and people thought for, for a while couldn't understand or explain what these were, these semi-regular pulses uh, which can be as far as a few milliseconds apart uh, from very, very far away in space. Today we know, and we learned this, I think a couple of weeks ago when we talked about neutron stars and pulsars uh, following um, uh, a, a woman scientist called Bell uh, who was working in Cambridge and she explained that these are actually the result of magnetic fields on neutron stars. And when the neutron stars spin very, very fast, the magnetic fields, uh, the magnetic field direction rotates around the axis of rotation of the neutron star. Whenever the magnetic field points to the observer, like right here, then uh, particles are accelerated along the magnetic field line. And then we see these pulses of radiation from the acceleration. So Justin Bell, today, Justin Bell Hewitt uh, explained this and these pulsars are now understood as a magnetic phenomena or a rotational magnetic phenomena from compact neutron star remnants of supernovae. We'll talk about those a bit later in the course as well. Uh, and are no longer associated with, with claims of aliens. But similar claims do exist. Uh, we, have, we have meteorites, the famous one here on the right, meteorites which crash on the earth and seem to have uh, features on them which look like some life existed. Uh, the most recent one, this is a claim from only four years ago on the left. It's an object at the outskirts of our own solar system called Oumuamua. Um, it was detected with uh, telescopes around the earth and on the earth and, thought, and the, its trajectory was followed. And it was a very bizarre object because it seems to travel on the opposite direction than everything else in the solar system. Um, so it seems almost as if the solar system is flowing through space and this object is not flowing with the solar system, but was, was here before us and just stayed in place as the solar system kind of sweeps through it. Uh, it's all, it also has some strange features in, uh, in size and shape and in composition, it's quite flat for an astrophysical object of that size. We don't expect that to uh, be, be prominent or be sustained for so long. Uh, so prominent physicists have also suggested that this might be an alien outpost uh, or some alien device or, or material placed around the universe, which we are now floating into uh, and encountering. Uh, and it's spurred a lot of debate. You can see some of it online. Uh, there was a lecture about that object specifically in the Technion about a month ago. 
Uh, and there are many other claims that people have, and every once in a while people will find something they cannot explain. Uh, suppose it was aliens, and uh, either we find a better explanation very fast, or the or it takes us a longer time and the claim kind of lingers on. The consensus today in the scientific community is that we don't have any definitive evidence or convincing evidence of any sort of alien uh, existence or presence or interaction with us thus far. But it's not that it's impossible, it's just that we don't have any evidence for it. And looking for that, for such evidence and for such uh, signatures is a very interesting part uh, and what can give birth to this field of astrobiology and, uh, and astrophys astronomical civilizations. Uh, so before we finish the, this, the historical background, any questions so far? No, okay. Uh, so the other side of this uh, point about not seeing any evidence of aliens uh, was raised by Enrico Fermi, famous physicist in quantum mechanics uh, in 1950. Enrico Fermi uh, famously gave the calculation of what today is known as the Fermi paradox or the earliest explanation of the, the Fermi paradox, which goes basically like this. Our galaxy is quite big. Uh, here we see kind of a, an illustration of the Milky Way galaxy and our position relative to the center of the galaxy. We'll talk more specifically about how we know this and how the galaxy was discovered and measured uh, and constructed, uh, or our understanding of it was constructed uh, in about three weeks after general relativity. Uh, depicted here on the right, we can also again see kind of this, the disk, the central bulge, our sun's location, about eight kiloparsecs or 28,000 light years from the center. Uh, and the entire disk of the Milky Way, it's, it's quite a flat uh, disk, uh, is only about uh, a few thousand, a few tens of thousand light years, up to a th hundred thousand light years uh, across from side to side. Uh, that those hundred thousand light years across include a lot of stars, about a hundred billion stars, ten to the eleven stars, and as we've seen before. In, uh, in stellar evolution and stellar energy production durations, most of these stars live for a very, very long time. Uh, typically, a star like our sun can live for about 10 billion years. Maybe some stars, uh, lighter stars, M-type stars can live for uh, 100 billion years. Uh, hotter and more massive stars might live a little, a little less, shorter, maybe. Uh, Hundred, uh, a billion, a hundred million years, but on the order of uh, a billion years. Uh, and there are many, many stars in, in, the, in our galaxy, a hundred billions of, billion of them. And comparing to the lifetime of these stars, order of billion years, the galaxy doesn't seem so big anymore. The diameter is only, as we said, about a hundred light, a hundred thousand uh, light years across which means if you flash a radio signal from one end of, edge of the galaxy to the other one, it will only take 100,000 years to reach. The galaxies existed and the stars have existed for about a billion years, which is, um, or, or, or even 10 billion years. So many, many orders of magnitude longer than that. Even if you only wanted uh, to, to send a, a probe, not an actual radio signal, uh, but to send, send a colony or send an actual, um, um, creature or, or even just a uh, robotic probe across the galaxy, within a reasonable time, you can reach a, a reasonable, reasonably fast velocity, uh, say one tenth the speed of light. And then it would only take you about a million years to cross the galaxy, the galaxy whose stars have existed for a billion or 10 billion years. So considering all of these uh, scales together, the galaxy being um, big enough to have lots of stars, which each of them live long and very, very long, but then the galaxy is actually quite short to cross uh, if you're approaching light like speed, then where is everybody? If there are so many stars, one of them presumably would have developed uh, life or intelligent life and 
eventually reach the capability of interstellar travel, or at least interstellar signaling uh, and radio signal, uh, and then we should have been seeing them. In fact, the galaxy is so small to someone who's able to travel uh, at light speed or near light speed that even uh, an, expand, an expanding colony or an expanding colonization process should have already occupied the entire galaxy. Right? If something start, if someone started colonizing, say, a billion years ago, and it only takes a million years to cross the galaxy, he could have crossed the galaxy back and forth a thousand times, um, uh, and obviously reached every point on the galaxy uh, already. Yet we don't see any clear evidence. So Fermi famously uh, shouted out in the middle of lunch, but where is everybody? Why do we not see them? Um, this again is related to kind of understanding uh, how long it would take a society or a civilization uh, to develop the technology required for uh, for space travel or even just for, for space signaling to produce radio uh, able to cross large distances. And this is uh, where we put this scale of technological advancements. Um, here it's given on a log scale. So it covers about a period in this axis of about a million years. Obviously, dates are not exact when we go to prehistoric times. Uh, it covers about a, a million years, but with much more resolution on the right side. On the right side, we can even get to, to decades or, or specific years apart. And here it's just normalized uh, on a log scale relative to the year 2000. So it's a log of 2000 minus T. And what we see on this log scale is that once uh, a species, specifically our own, um, starts to master technology, it then develops that technology very, very fast. It, it might be considered an exponential rate or even super exponential rate. So uh, from the first beginnings of, of mastering fire, this is, pre, this is actually pre-human times. Uh, this was not Homo sapiens, it was Homo erectus, which we believe are one of the precursors of modern humanity. Um, a, uh, a humanoid, uh, great ape or humanoid, however you like to, to uh, consider it, began controlling fire between a million to two million years ago, and we already have evidence archaeological uh, of that time. And it took almost a million years uh, from that point to the development of, of settled agricultural um, uh, societies. And we can see those by both uh, construction and by uh, crops changing. Uh, alongside with domestication of animals in the, I think, exercise three, uh, you calculated carbon dating for people buried with dogs, or the earliest domesticated animal, uh, order of a few tens of thousands years ago. So it took a, uh, almost a million years from fire control to agriculture and animal domestic, domestication, uh, but only 10,000 years approximately from agriculture to modernity to, to flying people to space. Uh, and so maybe you know, if it took on the order of 5,000 years from first agricultural society to the invention of the wheel uh, and then uh, land travel using wheels and then sea travel on boats or at least uh, river and, and coastline travel um, alongside with domestication of, of horses for more uh, faster land travel uh, and, and writing, which developed at the time, not the alphabet, but uh, just writing using a, a kind of um, uh, pictorial depictions. Uh, that took 5, 000, about 5,000 years from agriculture. And again, in another 5,000 years, we've already gone to the moon. Uh, so we see that the, the, the pace of these technological breakthroughs increases and it increases at an increasing rate. Uh, at the same time, it took to go from agriculture to the wheel or to writing. We've gone through uh, from the first boats on a river to crossing the entire Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean in 1492, and then circumnavigating the entire globe over the Pacific uh, 
1521 or 22. So the, the pace here as well is, is rapid. Uh, it then only took in less than 500 years, we've gone from crossing the entire world with boats uh, through trains, uh, which again, within decades of the invention of the steam engine, already we had steam trains. And shortly after that, um, ra railroads and, and trains crossing entire continents from the Atlantic to the Pacific, for example, in the, in the US Transcontinental Railroad. From the first attempt at, at, at human flight, we had the hot air balloon at the end of the 18th century. By the beginning of the 19th century, we already had the, the Wright brothers' uh, first plane. And within 50 years of the first plane, we landed on the moon, or 51 years from the first Wright brothers' flight in 1908. In 1969, men walked on the moon. And already in the late 50s, we went into space. So technology develops very, very fast once it gets started. That's kind of the, the point of this, uh, of this um, page of this, this slide. Uh, and so we expect that once a society is able to develop technology, it will very shortly, uh, very quickly leave its, its, own, home, its own home planet, uh, either in colonization of, of its solar system or ex other solar systems in space flight, or even just in radio broadcasts. The first one, by the way, is, is represented here. The first radio broadcast around the turn of the 19th to 20th century uh, with uh, Hertz and Monconi and other early developments in radio. Less than 50 years after Maxwell uh, wrote his Maxwell equation, so we understood electromagnetism and immediately were able to, almost immediately on a historical perspective, were able to broadcast radio uh, across the planet. And already in the 30s and 40s, we were able to broadcast strong enough for the signal to reach nearer, uh, near stellar system, Alpha Centauri and other ways. Uh, so we do expect the ability to, we expect any society developing technology to very quickly be able to break from its own home planet. Any questions? Okay. So again, this expectation of a, a civilization quickly reaching the ability to go out into space, either physically or, or with transmissions of electromagnetic radio uh, and other, other parts of the spectrum, uh, only amplifies the question of where is everybody? Uh, if it's so easy, how come we have seen none so far? And this leads us to the central equation in the field, uh, the, word the word equation here should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, it's basically trying to represent our knowledge or, or our understanding of this issue more than actually quantifying uh, exactly uh, any basic law of nature or observation of nature. Uh, it's basically breaking a question for which we have no answer into a series of simpler questions which we might hope to answer, maybe. So the Drake equation uh, named after Frank Drake, a famous astronomer here on the right, he actually spent a lot of his career searching for signals uh, from outer space and radio, microwave, and other parts of the bandwidth, uh, especially the 21 centimeter line, which you remember from, uh, from your homework exercise on in hydrogen um, spin transitions for electrons. Uh, so Drake, gave this kind of breakdown of the, of the question. He said, how many civilizations do we uh, expect to find? That is, how many civilizations do we expect to find that have developed to the point of being able to transmit communication which we can detect? We'll call that number N. And we'll, for this, point, for this point in time, we'll just talk about our own galaxy, which itself is big enough. So we're trying to calculate or to, to estimate this number N on the left. Let's try to see what are the processes required uh, to reach this level of a society or technology. So kind of in a probabilistic sense, let's ask how, what has to happen for these aliens to exist and communicate with us. 
And that's this product of, of different elements which he tries to understand. So the first one uh, is to ask how many stars are there in the galaxy? Or in another way, uh, what's the rate of creation of these stars? Because we assume that a civilization has to, has to uh, evolve on some planet around some star. That's the energy source. Uh, the, at least it's our energy source uh, here on Earth and in the solar system. Uh, and energy is something a, a civilization would need. Any biology, any technology would need a source of energy. Uh, so we'd need stars. So we start with the rate of star formation in the galaxy, uh, which is our star or the rate of star formation. Not all of those stars will be good for, uh, for life. First of all, they have to have plants. A lone star is not good enough. No. A, a binary system of stars also might not be good enough. Uh, if, if when a protostellar cloud collapses uh, to a disk and then forms just a, a bunch of stars, these stars cannot actually develop life. Everything is hot plasma. That's not what we're looking for. We need planets. So we have this FP, the fraction of those stars which have planets around them. The next thing you would need uh, is not just any planet. You need planets which are hospitable or habitable. Planets which have conditions suitable for an ecosystem. So the planet can't be too hot, can't be too cold, uh, can't be too big, can't be too small. It has to be in what, what we call affectionately the Goldilocks. Uh, zone. Uh, Goldilocks is English for the Hava from uh, the three bears. Uh, not too hot, not too cold, it has to be just right. Uh, so the average number of those planets around the star which will fit to develop an ecosystem, that's, that will be NE, so the number of ecosystem capable planets. Of those planets, uh, not all Although they, they all could develop life, life, maybe not all of them will develop life. So we'll have another fraction FL, the fraction of those planets with a hospitable ecosystem where life would actually be created. Of those, we have FI, a fraction of planets uh, which have life and manage to develop intelligent life. For example, on the Earth, uh, we, okay, intelligence is not well defined, uh, but if we consider uh, the hominid races, uh, species as the ones which are intelligent, then there was no intelligent life on the earth in that uh, perspective, uh, in that definition, until very recently, a few million years ago. Uh, even though the earth has existed for over 4 billion years, and it's had life or close to that. Uh, so this FI is another parameter that we say, maybe not every place that develops life actually reaches intelligent life. Of those planets which, uh, which manage to develop intelligent life, maybe not all of them reach the point of being able to communicate across different stars and across the galaxy. Uh, so we have another unknown parameter here, FC, uh, the fraction of communicating civilizations out of the intelligent ones. And finally, uh, because we started with a rate, to get a number, we need to multiply it by some, by some time. And the relevant time here would be the longevity or length of in time of the, the lifespan of an intelligent space communicating civilization. How long before it, from the moment it reaches the ability to transmit into space uh, until it disappears or loses that ability, either by uh, extinction, uh, Self-extinction, extinction, external extinction, giving up on the notion altogether, uh, or anything else that could stop that society from existing. So Drake transformed kind of this um, unknown, or how many aliens should there be, alien societies, into a series of numbers, which we can now discuss on a more level uh, ground, maybe try to understand them to measure them, to estimate them, to calculate them uh, one by one. And we'll see that some of them we understand better and some of them we have no idea about. Any questions thus far?
Okay, so let's start going over these one by one. The first thing we talked about, stars. We need stars to, uh, to source energy. We need stars um, to, to house planets or to uh, sustain planets around them. Uh, and as we said, there are about 10 to the 11, 100 billion stars in our galaxy. The age of these stars and the age of the Milky Way is about 10 billion years. So we can kind of approximate the average star formation rate or star production rate at about 10 stars a year. That's the, the overall budget of stars uh, that we have. 10 stars a year on average form in our galaxy. However, um, they will not all be available to us in the same way. Uh, not all of them are relevant for life. As we saw previously in the course, heavier stars burn out faster. They burn brighter and they run out of fuel much, much faster. Uh, so heavy, so the heavy stars are not of interest to us. We're basically only looking at stars that are um, similar to the sun, to the sun. Um, maybe, maybe B, G, or M type stars, K type stars. We're not looking at not, not looking at um, um, O or A huge stars which run out very quickly. Um, also, as we saw, heavier stars will have uh, will typically be variable stars. Right? We saw on the HR diagram stars that are higher up in luminosity and in mass, uh, and, and become or approach giant status, giant stars. Uh, they tend to be variable. They're not as stable as our sun. We saw that with Betelgeuse, for example, which has a periodic uh, variability. Uh, and unstable stars, stars that are bigger and heavier and more luminous, um, this variability for them is a problem. Because if you consider a planet around such a star, if the sun were, say, twice as bright one year than the last year, uh, it would not allow for an ecosystem to stably develop uh, if you know, all life suddenly gets twice as hot as it, as it is used to. It's hard enough for us with current global warming rising a few degrees in a, in a, in a decade, uh, but multiplying or doubling the energy input from a star over a short period of time might not let the ecosystem and the life on the planet time to, to react and to evolve fast enough. So extinction. There's also a problem on the opposite side, stars that are much smaller than the sun, as we remember about one half solar mass or lighter, um, are fully convective. They have convection all the way from the nuclear reaction burning core to the edges of the atmosphere of the, of the star. That means that, again, they are variable, as we saw in the previous, um, previous lesson, it means that phenomena like um, sunspots, solar wind, coronal mass ejections, and basically every any activity uh, that uh, changes the surface and, and outside and explodes and, and removes matter, transform, transfers matter out of the surface and into the environment of the star will be much more dangerous and much more common. Because if convection cells reach all the way from the core to the surface, then the star will be spewing out not just um, a few thousand Kelvin degrees um, material on the outer, outer part of the, of the star, it will be throwing out parts of the core at a million degrees. And it will be throwing out uh, a lot more material and a lot hotter material. Uh, and this again will probably threaten and destroy or uh, um, eliminate and cause extinction for any life that might be budding and developing on planets around that star. So again, we need stars uh, that are neither too big, neither too small, neither too hot, neither too cold. They have to be kind of in this middle stable region, which is approximately where our sun is, which is considered a, a very uh, quiet, stable, and comfortable star to live around. Another problem is that for chemistry required for biology, we need heavier elements. We can't just create life with hydrogen and helium. Right? All of life on Earth is based on carbon, 
uh, it involves carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, and, uh, and other higher elements, me metals, uh, metals in chemical sense, not in the astrophysical sense, actual, uh, the iron in our blood, um, which creates the hemoglobin, which carries the oxygen in our bloodstream. Uh, iron is a very heavy metal, uh, and it's not created in our sun in any case. Um, our sun burns hydrogen to helium, so all of these heavier elements uh, in the solar system and in our bodies required for our biology have to come from other stars, uh, from older stars, population two stars, which finished their evolution, uh, died away as supernovae and distributed matter around the universe. So population one stars like our sun uh, are relevant because they've all, they were created from previous ones. And so heavier elements are already available. Uh, but population two stars, that's the, the previous generation, uh, we don't expect to be very rich in heavy elements, and therefore we don't expect them to be able to uh, develop a biology or to have a biology develop around them. This is further complicated uh, by the fact that we have an average stellar production rate, which we calculated, but we don't know the distribution. We only know the average. We don't know uh, what are the more common star types and star masses. Uh, how many of these 10 a year, more or less, are created with heavy masses? How many are created with smaller masses? Um, how many of them are created with masses that are too small or too heavy? And how many are in this, this Goldilocks zone? So we have questions here, uh, questions of astrophysics, of basically calculating probabilities and distributions of various stellar formation mechanisms either studying this statistically by observations or analytically by processes creating stars. Uh, and these results have direct, direct impact on how many stars are created in the, in the galaxy, which are suitable for actual development of life in our galaxy. So a bunch more unknowns. Any questions? Okay, let's take a, a 15 minute break and continue at 1.10 uh, with the next stage, which is plants. I'm here for questions if anyone has any. 